Hello, Jay Rose, and today we're going to be talking about accidents, uncover substance on Paul Virilio and how unforeseen accidents help us identify what is philosophically accidental, suggesting possible glimpses of the hidden. This was inspired by the conversation between Raymond and Joshua Hansen, and I greatly suggest Raymond K. Hessel's uh, YouTube channel. He really analyzes texts in fascinating ways, and also will explore books that a lot of people um, ignore. And he had a conversation with Joshua Hansen, and Joshua will be releasing a book very soon on academia. He does such great work on analyzing the university system today, and he's talking now, uh, seeing the metaverse, the, uh, the, 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 the metaphysical implications of that, the philosophical implications of that, and just does magnificent work. I've always enjoyed speaking with Mr. Hansen. And uh, Raymond also recently released a book, and I finished the first essay on the mobility of Plato's cave as a pod, and I just think it's magnificent, so I suggest that as well. Um, there's been a lot I've heard about Paul Virilio. I've read some Paul Virilio, but I am now convinced that I need to dedicate a month to Paul Virilio. He was clearly a super genius. Uh, Daniel Frege in his book Ontological Design mentions Virilio. And again, I know about the information bomb and I know about his uh, general concept of how accidents unveil truth. But what was so fascinating about this discussion is how Raymond and, and Joshua really focused on the idea that the Virilio is kind of making a word play on the classical notion of accidents when he talks about accidents. Um, you know, there's that famous quote from Virilio on the idea that when we invent the ship, we also invent the shipwreck, that every invention brings with it a corresponding accident or possibility that is unforeseen, that is not planned, that is very consequential. Um, What's very interesting is that in classical philosophy, an accident is something non-essential to the being of an entity. So, for example, if we let's say we have a cat and the cat is white. We could say that whiteness is accidental to the cat, but it is not part of the substance of a cat because cats can be different colors. They can be white, black, orange, whatever. And so whiteness is accidental to a cat, whereas, say, the particular genetic code of the cat is substantive. It is the substance of the cat. So you have this distinction between accident and substance, where a way to, you know, a basic, simplistic way to put this, simple way to put this, would be to say that um, accidents are non-essential while substance is essential. Now, Virilio's insight is that we really don't know what constitutes the accidental from the, su su from the substantial until an accident, which is to say that accidents deconstruct the accident, suggesting the substance. So here's kind of the play. Um, we only think we know what is the substance of something uh, versus the accidents of it until an accident, until an unforeseen event, and then the real substance emerges. Until the accident, are the very distinction between accident and substance is probably ideologically situated, and it's probably hidden, because we tend to try to avoid the truth of things and the substance, because that can be traumatic, um, as we'll get into later. So what Virilio suggests with a really fantastic wordplay on the word accident is that accidents unveil accidents, um, which then means they unveil substance, they unveil the truth, and they can unveil that what we thought was the substance was actually the accident, and what we thought was the was accidental was actually substantive. Um, take the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the, you know, this is a very unforeseen event, and until the 2008 financial crisis, we can think of, say, banks as accidental to capitalism, where, say, small business, the pricing mechanism are substantive, but banks are just, you know, boring and to the side and kind of infrastructural, but not really a big deal. Well, after 2008, it turns out that banks are too big to fail, that they are essential to the um, capitalist order. And thus, the truth of capitalism today is very different than we may have thought. The accident of the 2008 financial crisis unveils that really, it's almost like small business is accidental while banks are substantive, where the substance of capitalism today is banks and the small business and uh, the small government, all that other stuff that people tend to associate with capitalism, especially if they're conservative and free market people of a of a more libertarian bent, uh, will suddenly the 2008 si accident the black swan can unveil that banks are essential and the, and the small business is accidental, when up until that moment, a lot of people probably thought the opposite. So the accident unveils the substance, and before the accident, the black swan, 
uh, one can have a view of what constitutes the philosophically substantive and the philosophically accidental that, say, serves a libertarian conception. But then with 2008, it suddenly unveiled that that um, ideological framework um, is, in fact, an ideological framework that it doesn't necessarily correspond. Now, more libertarian people may say, well, this doesn't disprove libertarianism. It just shows that if you don't follow small government, you end up in a capitalism that is crooked or crony capitalism or mixed market, and that's all well and good. Um, no one is saying that necessarily libertarian solutions to the problem are wrong. That's an entirely different conversation. Mainly the idea that we're exploring here is how the accident unveils the substance. The, the accident unveils the truth, if you will, because I think you can use the logic of Virilio to discuss substance and truth kind of interchangeably, even though truth and substance are not philosophically equivalent terms. I think practically in this situation they are. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is, although it is not the case that accidents, as in black swans, are technically necessary for us to grasp the substance of a thing, they end up being practically necessary simply because of how we as humans humans are and operate. And what I mean by that is it would seem that humans are so ideologically situated, so prone to confirmation bias, so um, magnificent at self-deception, that it's really not until the accident that we get to the truth and substance of matters. Um, it, it's just not the case that humans can ever be good enough at critical thinking to really get at the truth. Um, and in fact, thinking we're good at critical thinking just is part of the self-deception. Um, so humans seem really, really good at, um, at cognitive tricks. And so that being the case, we really don't get what a thing is until it breaks. But this is, of course, counterintuitive So because we make things not to break. So rather it be an ideological system of philosophy, an invention, whatever it is, humans make things not to break. Because arguably, once they break, they're not even themselves anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know we, you, arguably, we only consider a dishwasher a dishwasher when it works. When something breaks, it seems to lose itself. Um, in a sense, and, and, and yet at the same time, it would seem to be only in that breaking that we quote unquote get what the thing was that broke and left us behind. Um, there's a sense here in which revelation is always late. And there is for Virilio seemingly a strong connection between revelation and accident, the breaking, which is kind of funny because that would mean that we get the revelation precisely when it's almost like no longer matters if we have the revelation because the thing is broke. Um, that, that at least can be suggested. So it's precisely say when the dishwasher breaks that we get a, we actually, well, and this is kind of true because, you know, when a dishwasher breaks, it turns out that that little plastic part in the corner was essential. And until it broke, it was easy to think that that little piece didn't matter. But then when it breaks, you suddenly go, oh, it matters very much. The whole dishwasher doesn't work. So in the breaking of the dishwasher, there's a revelation of what is essential to its operation and what is not. And yet it's precisely when the dishwasher, in a sense, is no longer practically a dishwasher that you learn that essentialness. And this is a very interesting paradox that I think Virilio put his finger on. So likewise, it's almost like the operations of an ideology or a society are unveiled as the essential operations of it precisely when the arbitrariness of it, perhaps, or the ideological bent uh, is unveiled which almost would then seem like it's too late. There's almost a way in which revelation is always awaiting for Godot in this structure. And yet it seems like it can be no other way precisely because humans by definition must make things to avoid accidents. We, we, if, you, if we plan an accident, um, then it's not an accident. And so revelation always has to be something we don't in a sense want because we don't want accidents. And it would seem like it has to be that way because we are in the business of, we're just so good at avoiding um, truth. We're just so good at self-deception that it has to be in a kind of breaking that the truth comes out. And arguably this, there's a precedent for this in theology. Many religions have this notion of it's when uh, you know one accepts that they're a sinner. It's when they're on the cross. It's when idols break. Um, it's when it's these are the moments of revelation. That, that revelation almost has to come not from a design, but from the failure of a design. Uh, that there seems to be a the I, one would have to expand on this, but there seems to be a theological basis for this. Um, anyway, Virilio also was very interested in the information bomb 
which is this world where information has taken over everything, which I think we can associate with big data, AI, the singularity, all these different things, similar technologies. And you know what Virilio was interested in is what would be the inevitable accident that would arise that would unveil the substance of the information bomb. Um, we can't know. We don't know. Uh, there's no way to know. You know what will be the accident that unveils the substance of the information bomb, of which we can have confidence in, as opposed to just our ideological take on it, which we have reason not to trust, precisely because it's from within a position of self-deception and ideology. Um, will we be ready for it? So there's this kind of question that inevitably there will be some sort of accident with the information bomb, and if we're not ready for it. It may overwhelm us and destroy us, uh, but if we're ready for it, then we might be ready for it. But this is kind of interesting because how in the world do you get prepared and ready to handle an accident, something unforeseen? What in the world does that mean? By definition, you can't prepare for something unforeseen. I think this might suggest uh, the role of intrinsic motivation, communities of absolute knowing, all these topics I, I explore often. And I think Virilio, for me, is suggesting another reason why the best mode of being is one of intrinsic motivation. But that is another topic for another time. We expand on it, Michelle and I, in episode 76, OG Rose Conversation, and it's something that comes up a lot. Um, so again, another reason why it would seem that accidents are needed to unveil substance is because substance is truth. In truth, we can associate with Lacan's The Real, which is traumatic, and we do everything in our, possi our possibility to avoid it because, it, you know, the real is what unveils our imaginary and um, imaginary and socially constructed um, systems, symbolic systems, as in fact being constructed if, in order to avoid the real. Um, now, again, I think we can get better and approach the real more and more, but you know, we're all in the business of avoiding the real or at least learning how to vent it, to ventilate it in a manner so that we can handle it. Um, and basically, accident, we're so good at creating the imaginary and the symbolic that only the accident can kind of force us to face the real. And once that occurs, the question will be the following. Are we ready for it or are we not? But again, why would we prepare for something unforeseen? Well because we do so secondarily out of an intrinsic motivation, but that would mean intrinsic motivation is very um, primary um, and that, that we really, really need it. Um, so uh, the accident unveils the real and otherwise we avoid the real or our notions of the real is in of itself serve, in service of the imaginary and symbolic or the ideological. Um, and so there's a way also to what this means is that if accidents are traumatic, it just, it's just fascinating to me because what Virilio connects together is accident and truth. And we tend to know that accidents are traumatic, are tra traumatized. And then there's a history of associating truth with trauma. So in linking accident and truth with, you know, truth slash substance, it's a, it's a wise move that Virilio is making because indeed accidents are traumatic and there's something about truth that can be traumatic. Um, and this would also suggest that revelation comes in the place of the traumatic. Um, and then the question is, how can we handle, if we can't, well, it would suggest that if we can't handle trauma, quote unquote, then we can't handle revelation. And this would also suggest if indeed the accidental is necessary for the revelation of the substantive, then all progress has an accidental character to it. <coughs> we don't really progress unless there's something accidental, but then that progress will be contingent upon our ability to handle the accidental, which would suggest Hegel. And so substantive progress is accidental. For more by O.G. Rose, please visit ogrose.com. And also please go see Raymond and Joshua's conversation, which was truly magnificent. And thank you so much for your time.